right, if you got your Bibles, let's open up to two places. We'll go to James chapter 1 first, and then we'll be in Proverbs chapter 1 for the rest of the evening. James chapter number 1. Read a couple verses here in James, and we'll pray, and then we'll be over in Proverbs. James chapter 1, and we'll go over here to Proverbs. Lord willing, we'll see how it goes. We're going to preach some through the book of Proverbs. And the subject we'll deal, especially tonight, with wisdom that's from above. James chapter number 1, notice if you will, come down in uh, James chapter number 1 to verse number 5. Then we'll go over to chapter 3. James chapter 1, verse number 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally. You didn't know God was a liberal, did you? <laughs> that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Come over to chapter 3, James chapter number 3, verse number 14. James 3.14, But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. So that's wisdom that is from above. So come over to Proverbs chapter number 1, and we'll get into our message for tonight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the time to get into the Bible, and I pray, Lord, that you may help the Bible to get into us. Lord, I pray that you might speak to our hearts with the Word of God. Thank you for this book that definitely changes us and transforms our life, and I pray, God, that you may Use the message, you may set the man aside, and you may get a message to us from heaven. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Proverbs chapter 1, obviously verse number 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. We know that Solomon is the author, and we know from later on in the book of Proverbs that Solomon also collected some Proverbs. He didn't write every single proverb. He was a collator of Proverbs as well as writing many, many Proverbs of his own. Now, if you remember in your mind, you go back to when God called David to be king and then gave him a son named Solomon. Solomon had that huge responsibility of taking over the kingdom from David. And the first thing he did was, when God came to him and says, What do you want? God came to Solomon and Solomon said, God, give me wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. The Bible tells us over in 1 Kings chapter number 4 that he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrahite, and Heman, and Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. We have one song in the Bible called Song of Solomon. He wrote 1,005 songs. Verse 33, And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even into the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. You also remember, if you know your Bible, that the queen of Sheba, a very wealthy queen, came to Solomon and, and came to check everything out. The Bible says that that he answered all of her questions. There was nothing that she had that, that, she, that, that she brought that he couldn't answer and he couldn't expound on. And she was just amazed at his wisdom and his insight and also his wealth and how God had blessed him. Now here's the thing about Proverbs. When you read Proverbs, you're not just reading these pithy sayings from a very, very smart man. We're not talking about knowledge. We're talking about wisdom. I'll get into that in a second. But you're reading these Proverbs from a man who made the mistakes that he's talking about. He goes a little bit further there in Proverbs and he'll talk about the wicked woman and how a man can get ensnared and, and Solomon got ensnared by wicked women. 
And so when he talks about these things, he talks about a man having a son and he hopes his son's not a fool. And He talks about a foolish person. Solomon had a fool for a son. His name was Rehoboam, if you know anything about history. Rehoboam was a fool because he rejected the counsel of the old men and he followed the counsel of the young men that came up with him and he lost the whole kingdom. Solomon made a lot of mistakes and God taught him some things and obviously when he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit we have a wealth of wisdom in these Proverbs here. Now Adrian Rogers said a proverb is a short sentence based on long experience. <laughs> and that's, there's a lot of truth in that. You talk about experience. I don't know how many of you do this but I do recommend a proverb a day will help keep the devil away. I don't know how many times, I've, hundreds of times I've read Proverbs. Uh, literally, uh, you read it through every every month. Uh, that's twelve times a year plus your regular Bible reading three or four or five six times a year. For so many years, you go through it a lot. There's a lot in Proverbs, and a lot of us are familiar with it, but sometimes we don't sit and soak it in. So we're just going to look at the chapter. We're going to get some truths out of this chapter. Hopefully tonight, dealing with the cry of wisdom and the wisdom that comes down from above. So Proverbs imparts God's truth and God's rules. Literally, that word proverb is a rule. It's a, it's a standard. And, of course, when we talk about Proverbs, there are modern-day Proverbs. There are Proverbs uh, you have grown up saying and have heard all your life. What about look before you leap? That's a good proverb. A stitch in time saves nine. I don't know what that means. But I know it means something. A penny saves, a penny earned. Early to bed, early to rise, makes a help man healthy, wealthy, and wise. You ever heard of that one? All right. Here's a Zulu proverb. He who walks into a thunderstorm must put up with the hailstones. <laughs> Scandinavian proverb. Love makes an old man blind. <laughs> now here's some modern proverbs. I can please only one person today. Today is not your day. Tomorrow isn't looking good either. <laughs> Modern day proverb. Living on earth is expensive, but it does include a free trip around the sun every year. Um, somebody will look back on all of this and plow into a parked car. <laughs> Birthdays are good for you. The more you have, the longer you live. Amen. That's true. Marriage is an institution in which a man loses his bachelor's degree and the woman gets her master's. <laughs> tell me what you need and I'll tell you how to get along without it. Uh, you know, ever use that little etc. ETC dot dot dot? It's a sign to make others believe that you know more than you actually do. <laughs> How long a minute is depends on what side of the bathroom door you're on. <laughs> Last night I lay in bed looking up at the stars in the sky and I thought to myself, where the heck is the ceiling? <laughs> All right, Proverbs. Notice I want you to look at this in verses 1 through 9. First of all, wisdom's purpose. You'll notice in verse number 2, first of all, the Proverbs are given to teach. He says to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding. So God gives us his Bible to teach us something. I'm glad that we have experiences in the Christian life and I'm glad that we have feelings. I'm glad we can know God and we can feel God and we can be moved by the Holy Spirit. But the Bible also presents our faith as an intellectual exercise. We are to love God with our minds. So what God does is he quickens our minds and he teaches us things in our minds so it will affect our heart and the things that we learn will affect our will. And so he teaches some things. And so the Proverbs are given to teach. And you'll notice also the Proverbs are given to train. He says to know wisdom and instruction. You know, 2 Timothy, it says all scriptures given given inspiration of God is profitable. It goes on to say for instruction, to be instructed. And oftentimes when you receive instruction, you're given tests. And you're evaluated to see if you can follow the guidelines and if the instruction took. And sometimes you go through life and you have these little tests. And sometimes I believe the Lord is instructing us in the ways of righteousness. And we have to go through those things in order to 
learn properly. It's one thing to learn something from a manual or from watching some YouTube video. It's another thing is to go bloody up your knuckles underneath the hood of a car. Amen. Amen. And so to get instruction is a little deeper. You'll notice the purpose of the book is to instruct, to train. Now we have this idea of knowledge, we have the idea of wisdom, and we have the idea of understanding presented in the book of Proverbs. Obviously knowledge is facts. I mean we get that. We're living in the information age. You just want to be a fact checker. You can type it in and, and check out with whatever source you really think is credible because I'm sure Google never lies. And uh, we have wisdom. Wisdom. O.S. Hawkins defined wisdom as the ability to take facts and put them into action at the point of need. Adrian Rogers again on this. He said, wisdom is the capacity to assimilate and appropriate learning prudently. Wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view, which I think that actually gets into understanding a little bit. In other words, you have wisdom, that is how you use the facts. You can have calculus and geogra ge geography, not geography, what is it called? Geonomy, geonomy one of those things. Geonomy? Geonomy? <laughs> you can have all that stuff in your head and not know how to use a ruler and not how to cut a piece of wood. You know, five and seven eighths, okay? You know, you have to be able to put some stuff into practice. And so when God gives us these things, He's given us real life truth in these little sayings and sometimes he couples them together like he is in these first few chapters where he's giving us a truth along with illustration to teach us some things. God, Bob Jones Sr. said, God gave you, uh, God gave you, uh, give God your heart rather and he'll straighten out the kinks in your head. And so you have your heart, your will, your emotions, then you have your brain, your intellect. And God's trying to instruct you in the mind to get your heart to go along with God. You'll notice in verse number 5, he says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. You remember in Acts chapter 18, there's a man by the name of Apollos. And Apollos is a disciple. He was a disciple of John. And as Paul's ministry begins to expand and the gospel of the grace of God begins to propagate throughout the region, people begin to get a better understanding of why Jesus Christ died. Not only was Jesus Christ the Messiah for the Jews, but when Jesus Christ died, he died on the cross as a substitutionary atonement for everybody. But Apollos was still preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. He's baptizing people just like John did, manifesting Christ to Israel. So when Priscilla and Aquila got with Apollos, the Bible says they took him aside privately and said, the Bible says they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And then he took that knowledge that he had and he began to preach Jesus Christ. And so he's a wise man and when he's given the truth, he just adds to that wisdom and he takes it. If you are a true wise person, you can take a rebuke. You can take criticism. You can get out of your box of your self-pride and say, you know what? I'm not always right. I don't always perceive things right. Maybe the way I see it's not the right way. God forbid I might be prejudicial in my view just because of my life experience. Maybe I need somebody on the outside to look at it. And you can take a little bit of counsel. So a wise man will increase learning. The thing is, as Christians, we are to continue to grow in grace and in knowledge. So as we receive instruction from God, we can grow, hopefully. And that's the purpose of wisdom, to teach us, to train us. We're always training for the next battle. I didn't think 2020 would have this kind of a battle. This thing caught us off guard. Both situations we're dealing with now, and who knows what's right around the corner. I have no idea. Well, we're always in training. You'll notice also discretion here as he begins to go through here. Notice in verse number 5, a wise man will hear, will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So the idea is to understand. You'll notice in Verse number three, to receive instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. In other words, to interpret something is to be able to understand what the thing means. To be able to look at two things and compare them side by side like you often see in Proverbs. And to be able to make the comparison 
and to make a judgment. You mean to tell me, preacher, I am to judge things? I thought the Bible says, judge not, let you be not judged. That's the only verse some people know. And the other verse, you know, uh, Jesus turned the water into wine. <laughs> Jesus turned water into wine so I can drink. And judge not that you be not, lest you be judged. I always misquote it. You are to judge things. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, He that is spiritual judgeth all things. You are to make judgments. You are to be, have, be able to have just judgments. If something doesn't look right and line up according to the Bible, you should be able to know that and see that. Have discernment. The Bible mentions discernment in chapter number 2, verse number 11, and discretion. He says, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Knowledge will often destroy people, but discretion will preserve people. Just because you know something doesn't mean you need to open your mouth and let everybody know it. I don't care if you are the President of the United States or whoever. Everything you think, you don't have to say. Amen. And a lot of people just think because it's inside of them, they got to blurt it out. You might have some facts about somebody or about something, but it may not need to be told. Discretion. This is wisdom. The purpose of wisdom here to teach us, to train us. Notice in verse number 9. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Notice the ornament about thy neck. It, in, it implies a submissive neck instead of a stiff neck, as you see oftentimes in the Old Testament. He that hardeneth himself shall suddenly be destroyed, the Bible says, and that without remedy. To have a stiff neck, a hard neck, is kind of like a horse that won't move when you pull the reins and try to get him to move. It is to be stubborn, much like Rehoboam was, Solomon's son. Now back up, and then we'll move to the next section here. Notice one thing in verse number 7 that's very important about the entire book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You're going to see that thing over and over in Proverbs. So preacher, I thought fear in God just meant that you are to reverence God. That's the modern cliche that a lot of the preachers use, but it really doesn't line up with Scripture. Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter number 5, Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Reverencing God's not going to get you out of hell. And when you read over in the book of Hebrews, it mentions uh, godly fear and it mentions reverence as two separate things. The reference on that is Hebrews 12 verse number 28. Let's serve God reverently with godly fear, he says. Fearing God has to do with a terror that you are literally afraid when you consider the power of Almighty God. Now, we don't fear God in the sense that God's some big ogre and He wishes us harm and God hates everybody. Not in that sense. I don't fear God like I do somebody breaking in my house and shooting me or something crazy. But there's a healthy fear of God that's presented all throughout the Bible. The oldest book in the world, Job, says the same thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And here it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's a good place to start. Wisdom's purpose. But notice verse number 4, wisdom's pupils. Who is this written to? Notice a couple of different groups here. Verse number 4, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. So notice, first of all, it's written to the ignorant. The subtle, I mean the, uh, the uh, simple. To give subtlety to the simple. You say, what does it mean to be simple-minded? Uh, years ago they used the term a simpleton. To be simple-minded is to be easily fooled, it's to be gullible. Uh, in the scriptures you read a lot of uh, passages about someone that's simple. Chapter 14 of Proverbs in verse number 15, the Bible says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. The simple just believes what people are telling him and doesn't check it out. And just falls along with everybody. Uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 18, the Bible says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, some people will vote for a political candidate because they're good looking or because of their charisma. They really will. You say, what is that? That's a simpleton. 
They won't look at the issues on how the person voted or what their background is or their moral integrity. It's all just about looks. Or they won't come to a church. They'll get upset with the church because somebody didn't shake their hand. The preacher might be preaching gun barrel straight. The, or they may judge a service just on one service. The preacher gets up and hits a foul ball. And they say, I ain't going back to that church. Okay. <laughs> what about discretion? You say, what is that? That's ignorance. This book is written to bring some subtlety, to bring some understanding, to bring some knowledge, some wisdom to people that are ignorant. Probably one of the tragedies of modern day Christianity is ignorance of the Bible. We plateaued when you, when you got in the fundamentalist movement, you had a lot of kind of leftovers for some of the, from the, some of the revivals, and you plateaued with, with Bible training and Bible teaching and knowledge. You had a lot of the institutes and some of the greatest biblical teaching works were written 1920, 1930, 40, 50. And you start getting past that point, everything starts going down. And so biblical knowledge now, people aren't readers anymore. They don't read. It doesn't take a lot of time to read your 1189 chapters in your Bible. You say, that's a big thick book. Well, if we was to look at all the romance novels you read last year, I guarantee you, you'd have had plenty of time to read the Bible. So I don't read, I just watch YouTube. Okay, well, I know, that's another problem. People aren't readers anymore, and Christians are forsaking the one thing that affects their emotional and spiritual stability. You are a spiritual being, not just a body. And your spiritual psyche and soul and how all that affects is driven by words. And if you're not putting those words that are spirit and life, John 6, 63, into your spirit, you're going to be affected by that. Right. And so it's very important that you aren't ignorant of the Bible, but Christians are. And it's hard to encourage people to get into the Bible when we're so driven by entertainment. And everything because that's where modern Christians are. It's just so much easier to be entertained than it is to sit down with everything off and read the Bible. So this is addressed to the ignorant. You say, well, that's me. I just, I'm kind of simple about things. And if something's too complicated, kind of like I've, I do with, I'm not good at math at all. You say, what will you do? I'll pull out a calculator. That's what I'll do. Because if it starts getting too difficult, I just don't want to think about it. I'll just say, oh, it's just too hard. You ever do that? You ever do, oh, it's just too hard. You ever get some new stupid technological gadget or you finally get used to Microsoft Word, whatever version that stupid thing is, and you got it all figured out. You can do headers, footers, pages, all this junk, and then they change it. You're like, oh, I just don't want to learn anymore. It just hurts my brain to have to figure this new thing out. A lot of Christians are that way when it concerns biblical doctrine. They know John 3.16, but that's as deep as they want to go. They don't want to think about the implications of what somebody teaches when they use verses to prove baptismal regeneration from John the Baptist and from Peter. They, they don't want to try to think about it. It gets too complicated. Let's just start off with the basics and build properly. You don't start off with calculus. And so you got to start off and just read day by day. Here a little, there a little. But don't just shrug it off and stay. Some people are proud of their ignorance. There are preachers that literally, not none that I really fellowship with, but I know of them, up in the mountains especially, they are proud of their ignorance. They literally, and I'm not saying I can't stand up and you can give me a verse and I start talking about it and things come to my mind and I can start doing extemporaneous. I could preach extemporaneous. I could do question and answer extemporaneous. I could talk for several hours extemporaneous about the Bible because I do know some Bible and things. But most preachers, or a lot of preachers, I should say, in the hills, and they, they, uh, they're proud of their ignorance. They'll stand up, and based on a song or based on a testimony that somebody gave, they'll grab a verse, and they'll start preaching a message. And they're proud of that. And they don't study. They don't want to study. And therefore, there a lot of times, I'm talking about independent Baptist churches, they begin to almost go charismatic in the sense of, the way they validate that they have a relationship with God is that God gave them a parking spot at Walmart. It was a, mir it was a miracle. It was a miracle. Anybody got miracles? I got a miracle. 
And they go in and they start giving these little testimonies. And I'm not saying don't give God credit for the parking space. You understand what I'm saying. But it's like, you know, the car ran out of gas. And they sat there for five minutes and prayed. And it started again. And God put, ga God put gas in that car. It was a miracle. Well, I wonder if there's ever been an unsaved person that ran out of gas and waited a minute and crunked his car up. You think God put gas in their car? But see, they don't know any Bible, so everything's got to be experience. They have to validate the fact that they're saved based on the good works that they have. And everything has to be experience. You say, what is that? That's ignorance. The book of Proverbs is written for ignorant people. If you don't want to remain a simpleton, if you don't want to be deceived and just follow into what somebody tells you the Bible says, this is a great book. This will help us, us ignorant people. Notice next also in verse number... For it's not just for the ignorant, it's for the inexperienced. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Inexperience in itself is not bad. But there's always room for improvement. It's great to have a young person that's healthy, wealthy. Well, he's not wise yet, but it's good to be young. You think you know it all, but you don't yet. And to have room to grow and to learn. The best thing to do is not to learn from your own mistakes. The best thing to do is learn from somebody else's mistakes. And for the book of Proverbs, we certainly can do that. And so we have the pupils of wisdom. Notice also the, uh, the plainness of wisdom, verses 10 through 19. Here we're going to have these illustrations. And wisdom is personified as a female all throughout the book of Proverbs. In chapter 4, he tells, he tells us that we are to exalt her, speaking of wisdom, in chapter 4, verse number 5, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom with all thy getting, get understanding. You know, if people would go after wisdom, the wisdom from God, as much as they went after the next raise, or as much as they went after, after the next gadget, or the next vacation or the next fashion or whatever they're focusing their life on they might learn something from God with all thy getting get understanding have you ever wanted to read the Bible so much you got so much into your Bible and you got tired so you just stood up so you could read the Bible and not fall asleep because you really wanted to keep reading it you know, sometimes I wonder how, how our faith has gotten so comfortable, how much we really want it. And, and look, I know, I'm not trying to make it difficult. Salvation is not difficult, thank the Lord. Salvation is easy, but discipleship is difficult. Jesus Christ said, you want to follow me? You've got to take up your cross. You want to follow me? Let the dead bury their dead. You want to follow me? Forsake your mother, father, wife, your own life. Give it all up. It's not supposed to be easy to come to church on Wednesday night. It's not supposed to be easy to come on Sunday night. It's not easy to read your Bible four or five times a year. Not supposed to be. It's not supposed to be easy to practice the disciplines of the Christian life. With all thy getting, get understanding. Do you really want it? It's in here if we're willing to read it and to apply it, to pray on it, to put it into application. So it's written for the ignorant and the inexperienced. Notice the plainness of wisdom here. My son, verse number 10, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us wait late for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Notice that wisdom illustrates. Notice, let us, we, come. Everybody's doing it. Come on. You're not alone. We're going to do this together. And if you get in trouble, we'll be there to help you. <laughs> no, when you're the one that gets caught and taken off in the back of the popo's car, they're not going to go down there to bail you out. They're going to hightail it to the safe house, and they're going to forget about you, and they're going to hope you don't rat them out. They don't care about you. Let us. We're in this together. No, cough on somebody else. Don't cough on me. The plainness of wisdom. 
Book of Proverbs. Now, I, I will say this: all Bible is not uh, the Bible. The, the entire Bible is not for public reading. I don't. I don't believe that. I mean, some of the Bible. You ever read about how much the Bible talks about laying with people? I mean, <laughs> it's pretty graphic, you know. So and so lay with her, and he, this man, lay with this woman, and th that's pretty, pretty uh, out there. I mean, it's plain. Real plain. There's some stuff in here that's really plain. Very embarrassing if I was to stand up and read like some of the stuff in the Song of Solomon, uh, some of the stories in the very graphic. And the Bible's written in such a way when kids read through some of that stuff, they don't even notice it a lot of times, the way the King's English is written. But the Bible is very plain and God's wisdom is very plain so we can get it, we can grasp it. And here... Wisdom illustrates this scenario for us. She illustrates. And then she illuminates. Verse number 15. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. I picture Bathsheba talking to Solomon. Bathsheba speaks out of experience. Bathsheba got into trouble. She did wrong. She covered up. She learned through years of experience. And now, if we personify wisdom in that sense, of course, many times it's a father talking to a son, like David talking to Solomon. And no doubt Solomon sat around a lot of times and talked with David in his older years. He probably talked with uh, some of the other uh, Nathan and Gad and some of the other prophets and so forth back in that time. But here you think of a mother maybe telling her son, Look, when this happens, and this is going to happen, don't go with them. Notice verse number 15. Walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. In other words, eventually you're going to get caught. You better watch it. Verse number 18, they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Wisdom illustrates and wisdom illuminates. It mentions the different ways. There's the way of Cain. There's the way of Korah. Of course, there's the ways of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the ways of Moses. There's different paths. This is the path, he says, in the book of Isaiah, walk ye in it. Which path are you going to go in? And God lays out a path in the book of Proverbs by way of contrast. He has wisdom illustrated as a woman, and she's a wise woman. And wisdom is illustrated in that sense in contrast to a wicked woman, to the Babylonian harlot that's also in the book of Proverbs as a prostitute, which religiously speaking represents the great harlot in Revelation 17 and 18, which is the mother of harlots as far as religion goes. And so we have that contrast. There are two paths or two ways. Ways. One way leads to peace and to satisfaction, hard work, integrity, having a clear, clean conscience. The other way leads to deceit, lies, covering up, and destruction. And so this is very clear through the book of Proverbs. Notice the plea of wisdom, verse number 20. So the ways of everyone that is, or sorry, verse number 20. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the opening of the gates in the city. She uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. To those of you that say, I can't understand the Bible, God says, if you will listen, I will make known my words unto you. We're the microwave generation. We think if we can't understand it right now, then something's wrong. This is a spiritual book. Some things you're not going to understand until you're at the right place in your life to understand them. Amen. Wisdom, please. She cries out. You say, what does that mean? To cry out is to open your voice up loud like when the blind man cried out. He cried out, Jesus, thou son of David. Even Christ on the cross, the Bible says he cried with a loud voice. So wisdom is crying out. She says, listen up. She reasons. Uh, the Lord says in Isaiah, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God is a reasonable God. He understands that we think in logical processes, so he lays things out logically for us to understand. He says, come now, let us reason together. You need to understand, like the quote I gave by Bob Jones Sr., give God your heart and God will work the kinks out of your brain. 
We have finite minds. God has an infinite mind. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. David said, when I consider thy thoughts, how great are the sum of them. But wisdom says, listen to me. She reasons. Notice verse number 23. She reproves. Notice there's a public invitation. Notice that she cries at the chief place of concourse. Verse number 20, she utters her voice in the streets, in the opening of the gates. The gates, that's where they would come and they'd set up their market. The gates, that was the concourse. If you're ever in an airport, you'll, be at the, you'll see the main concourse. And that's the place where everybody's walking down, the public places. Wisdom is crying out publicly. It's a public invitation. It's a pressing invitation. There's an urgency to this. You can see it. You can kind of sense it. Because you have a simple person here and you have a scorning person there and wisdom is saying don't remain in your simplicity because eventually you will turn into a scorner. You see, in your life of faith, if you don't develop a trust in God, you will become cynical. And eventually you will become a scorner. And because the idea is for the simpleton to grow in wisdom instead of turning into a scorner and turning into a fool. She reproves. There's a public invitation, a pressing invitation. Scorners delight their scorners. Fools hate knowledge. I mentioned the airport. Here's a guy who rushes in. He's trying to get to his gate. And if you've ever flown much, you know what I'm talking about. You're trying to get there and you get held up and different things. And finally you get there and you... Good. I'm going to find my gate, go sit in my little spot, and what I do, I stick my preaching in or whatever, and I sit there, listen to some preaching or read the Bible or something like that. And uh, there was a guy, he ran, he rushed in, he thought he was going to be late. He finally got to his gate, and everything was good. He said, okay, I'll get me a little snack. And he did that, got him a little snack, kind of got easy, sat back, and he dozed off. And you know exactly what happened. He wakes back up and everybody that was sitting around him, you know, it's always crowded right there in your little area because everybody's waiting to be boarded. He wakes up and everybody's gone. He rushes up to the clerk. And you know what happened? They had already called. He goes, have you already called? Boarding call? Last call? Yeah, we've already called. Well, well but the, if, as, the flight's gone. Slept right through it. You see, the fact that people are not responding does not mean that wisdom is not calling out. People are just lulled to sleep. Or, in our day and age, they're so distracted. I've been reading some. I love to read history. I'm reading a great, so far it's great, a great history. It's a five-volume set on evangelicalism. And I'm reading about the, the Wesleys and Whitfield and uh, some of those other, uh, uh, the Moravians. You know, the Moravian missionaries are really responsible for the Great Awakenings outside of Jonathan Edwards, but all the connections, this is so neat, and I was reading something about Whitfield, he would preach four times on Sunday. And oftentimes he would preach for an hour and a half outside on many times 15 and 20,000 people. Now can you imagine, especially in Florida, now he was in Georgia, you ever been to Savannah? That's where, that's his old stomping grounds. Of course he was over in, in uh, London and England and all over in there as well, but he set up the orphanage and everything in, in uh, Georgia. Can you imagine being in the south, outside, listening to a guy preach for an hour and a half? I don't know if any of you all or even myself would do that with the Skeeters. Just because people aren't responding now, you say, where we are? We are in the Laodicean church age. People do not want it. They do not want the truth. They do not want wisdom. So how do you know? Well, you can just back up and evaluate the situation. Look at churches that are preaching the truth compared to churches who aren't. The churches that are preaching the truth, there's, there, people are not knocking the doors down to get in. The people that aren't preaching the truth, they have a lot of entertainment and other things, especially stuff for the kids, because your kid has to play every sport that's available, even if they have to miss church and everything, because, you know, they gotta, the kid gets to do everything they want to do. Isn't that how it's supposed to be? Um, anyway, those are the churches that are real successful. You think they're going to sit there for an hour and a half and listen to the Bible being taught? 
That doesn't mean wisdom's not crying out. Just because people don't listen. She reproves, she reasons. There's a public invitation, a pressing invitation. There's even a patient invitation. She's calling out. Day in and day out. The Lord says in Isaiah, All day long have I stretched out my hands unto a disobedient, gainsaying people. They detest wisdom, verse number 29. They despise wisdom, verse number 30. And then you see the payback, verses 24 through the end of the chapter. This is some sobering words. Because I have called, ye refused. I stretched out my hand, and no man regarded but ye have said it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whosoever, whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Wisdom's payback. The Lord says here, I'll laugh at your calamity. A laugh of condemnation. That's a sobering passage. You have the teachable teens, the thriving 20s, the thrifty 30s, the fiery 40s, the failing 50s, the sickly 60s, the senile 70s, the, sorry, the aching 80s, death, the sod, God. Verse number 26, derision. Verse 27, desolation. Verse 27, destruction. Verse 27, distress. Verse 28, Desperation. You know, people in hell are screaming and climbing the walls and begging to get out. They are, you talk about repentance, they are repenting in hell. And there ain't no hope now. And people don't want the truth now. It's going to be a sad day at the day of judgment. James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to men all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I'll close with this. Uh, we grew up with, I think it's the uh, world book encyclopedias. I don't know. Uh, some of your family, you probably had different ones. They came to the door selling encyclopedias or whatever, and you had to have them because, you know, you do your school reports, and I probably used them a few times to do school reports. But for the most part, you could take those encyclopedias now, and except for historical data that's in there. I think Britannica finally went out of print. They don't do an actual book encyclopedia no more. It's just digital now. Encyclopedias are a thing of the past. And a lot of encyclopedias now are just completely outdated. I mean, there are countries now, you go look them up, they've changed names in 40 years. <laughs> You think about how much and how fast knowledge and information is just, just changing. But the wisdom that comes from God is still in this book just like it's always been. And no matter what times we are in and what stress we are under, God has laid us out an infallible book for every single age. And God has given us the wisdom in this book here to get through whatever you're going to face in life. And the great thing about Proverbs is how practical it is. It will deal with every facet and area of your life in some way, shape, or form. And it will give you the advice that you wish your grandma was still alive so you could ask her. It's here. And we have a tro trove of truth in the Bible. Thank God for it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the scriptures. I pray that you'd help us to starve and thirst after righteousness. God, I pray that we wouldn't be just uh, frustrated maybe with some of the complicated issues of theology or things like that, but that we might enjoy the Scriptures so much so that we're, we apply them to our lives. God, help us, especially in times like we're dealing with now, to assess our own lives and just practical truth, Lord, from the Scriptures to apply it. I pray, God, that you might help us to approach this book 
in the right way. Help us to hear the call of wisdom, to avoid the scorners and scoffers and the fools that are just trying to please themselves and go along with the crowd. Lord, help us to listen to the still small voice. God, I pray that we'd still have an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, help us. I thank you for those that have come out tonight. What a blessing it is to have some people to preach to. Lord, I know these folks here want to know the truth. God, I want to know the truth and understand your word. I pray, God, that you might help us. You might open your word that we can follow in the ways of righteousness. Make the decisions that are pleasing in your sight. And at the end of the day, Lord, we're going to be glad that we made the right choice. We know that peace and contentment and joy comes from doing your will. Lord, help us. We pray that you might give us grace for the days that lie ahead. We do pray for law enforcement, first responders, those that are facing difficult times. Pray for the leaders of our land. We just ask that you might help them and give them guidance. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.